Welcome to Health IQ. I'm Dr. Alan Siegel. Today we have a special guest, Dr. Rachel Wright. She's a doctorate physical therapist and she specializes in pelvic floor therapy. Welcome, Dr. Rachel. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you so much for having me. So a lot of people hear about pelvic floor therapy, but I don't think a lot of people know exactly what it is. So what exactly is pelvic floor therapy? Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of important to first talk about what the pelvic floor is. Um, so the pelvic floor is a group of muscles. It is at the base of our pelvis. Um, so this is our pelvis right here at the base of our pelvis. Um, and uh, they perform important function in supporting our organs, um, helping with elimination, um, and also work uh, to support us posturally as well. Uh, so pelvic PT is basically a specialization. It requires extra education and coursework outside of the regular kind of DPT coursework. Um, where we learn basically the skills to assess the pelvic floor. Um, to do so, we do typically do it internally. Um, and so that requires basically special coursework and, um, and practice to do so. Uh, so basically just assessing those muscles, strength, um, the muscle kind of tightness, all that stuff basically, as I said, kind of internally. What conditions, I think mm -hmm. if we relate to conditions, what conditions might someone seek a pelvic floor therapist for? Like mm -hmm. what or symptoms mm -hmm. or, or things that are going on within their body? Yeah, so um, a lot of things um, and also a lot of things that I think that people wouldn't necessarily like, think of. Um, so I think kind of the biggest one out there is uh, urinary leakage um, and then also constipation, um, pain with intercourse. Um, painful menstruation, uh, constipation, even low back pain, hip pain, um, pregnancy, postpartum, uh, basically uh, kind of any kind of pain that people are, are feeling uh, related to that, whether again, it's back pain or hip pain or pubic symphysis pain, all of those can basically be treated by a pelvic PT. So in terms of uh, male versus female, obviously, you know, you mentioned a few different things. Uh, I would, you know, possibly think that Females probably seek pelvic floor therapy more than, than males, but it sounds like it, it could be for, for both genders, essentially, right? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, this is actually a very common misconception out there. Um, you know, uh, in some social situations I've, I've experienced, uh, a lot of men don't actually realize that they have a pelvic floor. Um, women as well don't necessarily realize that men have one. Um, men definitely have a pelvic floor. Um, and there are various conditions that a man can seek pelvic floor PT for, again, kind of low back pain that isn't getting better, if they have constipation. Um, we see a lot of patients actually post prostatectomy um, that have urinary leakage as a result of that, uh, even um, erectile dysfunction, um, and even just pelvic pain with like sitting. Um, so all of those are basically, basically conditions that a male can seek uh, pelvic PT for as well. And on the female side, uh, you know, postpartum, mm -hmm. during pregnancy, you know, what would be the appropriate uh, or, or when would a, you mm -hmm. know, a female seek your therapies and, mm -hmm. you know, specifically related to pregnancies, either you know, pre or post, mm -hmm. uh, what you know, symptoms and conditions mm -hmm. might they be looking out for? So um, I think that a lot of people think that pelvic PT is only for after pregnancy. Um, and uh, again, kind of a misconception. Um, so I can see patients during actual pregnancy. I tend to avoid the first trimester, but second trimester on, I think it's really important to assess, assess the pelvic floor. Um, if you wanna think about it, like again, um, the pelvic floor is kind of a hammock or a sling for our organs, um, including the uterus. Um, and as baby's weight is kind of pushing down on that uterus, what tends to happen is almost to like kind of hold baby in in, um, the pelvic floor can get pretty tight. Um, and as a result, kind of has like that can cause some dysfunction, like leakage. It could also cause issues in the low back, um, the sciatic, like the um, sciatic nerve, the SI joint, pubic symphysis. Um, all those basically can um, be the result of pelvic floor dysfunction during pregnancy. So um, you can see a pelvic PT during pregnancy. Um, and just because like the pain may go away after delivery doesn't mean that you necessarily have to live with that pain, which I think a lot of women kind of forget. Um, and then postpartum, uh, usually at that kind of like six to eight week mark, once they are cleared by their OB, um, I can start seeing a patient um, postpartum. And I do recommend that most patients who've had a baby do come to pelvic PT um, like after that six to eight week mark, because um, at that 
point, they're clear to basically go back and do anything they want. Um, they can go run and jump and do any kind of activity, and the pelvic floor isn't necessarily ready for that. Um, it's kind of just like a general like umbrella okay, um, but you really should have the pelvic floor checked out to actually make sure it's um, able to take on that kind of force. Like when we, uh, when we run, we take on like 50% uh, of our body's like weight through our body, like through our pelvic floor. Um, and if you just basically had all this pressure on it and uh, have, you know, extreme weakness there, how could you take on that much, like that much weight basically or pressure through that body part? And as part of your training, you know, understanding, you know, uh, the pelvic floor and what the load or the demands are, how do you assess patients to see where they're at and see what the health of the pelvic floor may be mm -hmm. um, objectively, subjectively, mm -hmm. you know, how do you take that assessment and then determine, okay, your body is ready for this extra yep. load or this extra activity mm -hmm. at this point? Uh, so part of it is their symptoms, right? So what, what symptoms are they experiencing when they are taking on that load? Um, are they having leakage every single step they take? Um, is it after a certain amount of time? Um, and then basically we assess the actual pelvic floor, the, um, the tension through the pelvic floor, the um, ability for it to, con like to actually contract and produce force, um, as well as the endurance, the ability to sustain force. Um, as well as even just like the um, ability of the um, fibers that are more in demand during faster movements, right? So like the fast twitch fibers, checking the, the strength of those um, fibers. Um, and then also putting them through a battery of tests and assessments, um, and again, assessing kind of before and after symptoms. So part of your examination, part of your treatment, um, you know, uh, objective measures, uh, muscle testing, you know, internal um, ex examination, uh, treatment, uh, that's all part of the process. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, to, to get, you know, a better assessment. Um, yes. And you mentioned, you know, back pain and, you know, even males and females, um, obviously back pains are very mm -hmm. general, broad, and, you know, 89, 90% mm -hmm. of the population will experience it. You know, what percentage, you know, would you say has a pelvic floor component or what maybe can be treated as part of it, depending on what's going on with that patient? Yeah, you know? it's, it's a high percentage. There's been some research on there. Um, again, I don't have the exact numbers on me right now, but um, like low back pain and incontinence, like there's a really high correlation. There's a really high correlation like um, post uh total hip um, replacement um, and incontinence as well. Um, I think the important thing to remember is like the buzzword when it comes to like the back and the hip and all that kind of stuff is the core, right? What is the core? So the core is kind of like a soda can that sits in our body. The dot, like the top of it is the diaphragm, our breathing muscle. Um, the body of it is our abdominals and our back extensors. And the bottom is actually the pelvic floor. So that's the floor of that core. So the second that there's some kind of like kink in that system, um, like one of those other muscles is gonna overwork, right? So oftentimes the abdominals aren't working so well. What's working more than the back extensors and often the pelvic floor, which is what people don't really like really think about. Um, so I always tell patients that like, um, if you have back pain and it's not kind of getting better in our normal like time frame, which is about that six to eight week mark, um, and there's like really no difference, then it's time to really check the pelvic floor because it's probably something going on there that's not being addressed. All right. And sometimes you could have, uh, like you said, hip, hip replacements um, where there's like cutting mm -hmm. and there's other things around it. And whether they had a bad hip for a long period of time or they've had other muscle skeletal components, uh, there might have been some uh, overreaction of the pelvic floor due to a weakness you know, mm -hmm. in, the, in the general region. And that overcompensation could be you know, within the pelvic floor. Sometimes there's nerve pain. Um, uh, correct me if it's, uh, 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 what's the? The patendal nerve. But yeah, pedendal nerve, that's the, the main nerve where mm -hmm. sometimes there's pain. Sometimes you can work with other providers to um, you know, assess those nerve issues, whether it's through um, you know, uh, other types of studies, mm -hmm. uh, working with physiatrists, sometimes working with pain management doctors to help address certain things yep. in com combination with what you do can really be effective for that patient depending on, uh, you know, sometimes really just getting that diagnosis is, is critical, right? Yes, um, also the other thing I wanted to also point out is um, talking about kind of the spine is people also forget about the coccyx, right? So I feel like the coccyx is one of those like kind of bones that has a lot of issues too. So if we look at like the pelvic floor here, it actually attaches right onto the coccyx, right? So um, a lot of time with like coccyx pain, um, the best way to address that is also checking and addressing it pelvic floor, like from the pelvic floor because you can't really really get to it from the spine, um, yeah, which I think is a good yeah. point. I mean, so many people that 
we hear of, right? Yes. They fall on their butt, right? Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times they'll have chronic pain and they mm -hmm. won't know why. Yep. And if they, you know, depending on, if they didn't fracture anything, it doesn't mean that they couldn't have caused some either subluxation or, you know, potentially like a dislocation of mm -hmm. like their coccyx and then uh, just the nerves and the muscles around it could be affected as yep. well. So, you know, chronic, you know, you know, butt pain from a trauma mm -hmm. uh, could be something that could be indic indicative of, you know, seeing a pelvic floor therapist. Correct. And um, in terms of like, like Kegel exercises and doing things that, you know, mm -hmm. people are familiar with, you know, how much does home care exercise versus what you do in, in the office mm -hmm. help with the overall component of, of the uh, outcome of the yep. patient? It's huge. Um, so I usually see patients about once a week. Um, and, you know, with like kind of like the, the, the nature of the treatment, that's kind of like that works well for patients. Um, and so not to kind of like, I don't want to demonize Kegels, but, um, I find that a lot of times Kegels are not actually the answer. Right. Um, again, a common misnomer with pelvic floor is that the pelvic floor is like weak. It's loose, right? So the best way to describe it is that muscles basically want to be kind of like in their sub, like their middle range. Right. So, um, if they're too tight, they're also going to be weak. And I find that like 75% of my patients, like what I'm seeing them for is actually pelvic floor that is too tight, not too loose. Um, and again, like Kegels totally have their place, but I think actually the, the bigger thing that people need to work on often is actually relaxing the pelvic floor, um, which may be surprising to some people. Um, and so there's lots of exercise to do with that. So we talked before about the core and the diaphragm. So even just kind of like getting people to coordinate the breathing with the pelvic floor, we want it to kind of work in like a piston. Um, as you inhale, everything's supposed to kind of relax down. And as you exhale, everything's supposed to contract up. And I find that most often with people, they actually do the opposite of that. Um, and so like, that's a huge thing to do at home. Um, and then there's exercises, like whether it's core exercises, whether it's doing like hip stabilization exercises, they, all those like muscles attach into this pelvis, right? Like our hips go here, right? All those muscles there. And then our core, like our abdominals attach here, our, um, back extensors attach here. So, um, like all those kind of strengthening and stretching exercises are going to be important as well. Um, and then if someone is having issues like tightness or pain, there are also devices like, um, there's wands and dilators and all that kind of stuff that patients can use at home. And I educate patients on how to use those at home to help them as well. Yeah, like you said, it's a very complex, you know, part of our body with a lot of muscles, ligaments, organs, right? Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of interacting in that. In that, so so it's more about like you stress, like uh, being like too tight, right? Mm -hmm. Too too strong. And then, so how about biofeedback? Is that something that would in, in to agree with something mm -hmm. that you're doing? Yes, and I tend to do that. There are different um, ways to do that. There are devices. I tend to lean more towards like doing it actually digitally, like with my finger. Um, and the reason for that is that um, some of the devices, so a lot of people, when they don't use their pelvic floor properly, what they actually do is they clench, like their, their, their butt clenchers, they kind of squeeze their glutes. Um, and the problem with some of those biofeedback machines is they don't discern between the actual like pelvic floor and the actual glutes. So I tend to like prefer digital because that way I can actually tell if someone is actually contracting their pelvic floor versus their glutes. And then urinary issues versus maybe gastrointestinal mm -hmm. issues. You know, I don't know if there's anything related with constipation. Like mm -hmm. you mentioned, sometimes things of that nature could be also related to pelvic mm -hmm. floor and, mm -hmm. and things you know, the more relaxed and the, mm -hmm. the more functional our, our, mm -hmm. our muscles are, mm -hmm. the better our body operates just in, in general, right? So. Yes, yes. I mean, if we think about um, like where kind of like our GI tract sits, right? So like our intestines are like in this general abdominal area. And if we're kind of tight throughout there, like this is always like the kind of like the posture that people are in, um, that's going to bind, like all the fascia is binding down there and all that, like things can't move as they're supposed to. All right. So how much of a pelvic floor disorder may be related to, you know, just everyday stress or everyday, you know, psychosocial, you know, yep. components, uh, psychosomatic stuff. Like yep. where some people that just tend to be, you know, a little bit more stressed, a little more anxious in their lives, maybe develop more pelvic floor. Obviously there's a lot of things like 
pregnancy or injury or, or other things that could, could cause problems, but is that a big part of what you see in, in some of your Huge patients? part, huge part. Um, so, you know, like going back to what you're saying with the pregnancy, right, like birth trauma, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, that could be a, a role. But so the best way to think about it is our vagus nerve. That's kind of like our fight or flight, like nerve response, right? Um, so the vagus nerve, when we are like, you know, the, the analogy I always do, we're trying to run from a bear back in the day, right? Like you don't want to like pee or poop in that situation. Right. And so what actually, like you actually have fibers of your vagus nerve that go to the pelvic floor to basically kind of shut that stuff down. Um, so uh, I always kind of try and stress with patients, I'm not trying to say this is in your head, but there is a piece of this that is very likely like nerve related, right? And like that like central nervous system that we kind of don't have control over. Um, so um, basically what's happening is that when we have increased anxiety, one of the areas that tends to get like, that has increased tension and tightness is the pelvic floor. And so it's basically the type of thing where we kind of have to like work to actively relax it over time to basically, so this, this response that's supposed to be automatic is not happening automatically right now. We have to make it happen on our own, basically like through the work together. And then eventually like your body will kind of catch up again and like realize like, oh, I don't have to like tighten this like when I'm like anxious all the time, right? Or I can kind of like, I have ways to, strategies to calm down. So there's ways to kind of calm that nerve down and we kind of talk through that together. Okay, so you're part uh, psychologist, yes. part public <laughs> floor therapist. But, uh, but speaking of, maybe do you have to work with other providers yes. as sometimes to, you know, as a kind of a team approach yes. to say, hey, this is definitely, you know, something physiological, but it also could be psychological as well. And or, you know, sometimes even medications to just, you know, relax a, a person, mm -hmm. relax some muscles, relax a body to allow your therapies to work better. Um, I would think that would be like a, a good team approach. Yes, uh, yes. Um, uh, so it's definitely psychologists are one. Another one is also nutritionists um, for a lot of people who have like the constipation type issues. Um, but yeah, that's like one of the first questions I tend to ask people like is if they are under like the care of a mental health professional and like, you know, it's usually something that we kind of work organically through, but yes. Are, are there any drugs or medication that would like uh, be hurtful or helpful to like what you're trying to accomplish or nothing? I mean, obviously the ones that could help, but would there any be thing that'd be a side effect that might cause pelvic floor dysfunction? Obviously you get constipation with certain yeah. medications. Like if you're taking pain medication, Valium, you know, yeah. Valium is, you know, significant, but morphine, anything like that. It could be, it could be. Yeah, I mean, as, as you yeah. said, exactly. Like any of like those, like, yeah, big pain medications definitely are constipating. Like I have patients who like won't go to the bathroom right. for like a week after taking that. Um, you know, I think also, a lot of like patients who've had GI issues, they kind of rely on certain things like Miralax and like by relying on those like over long-term periods of time, you're basically teaching your body not to do it on its own, like its natural process. So like things like that um, tend to kind of be like red flags, I guess, towards like for me. And patients that have had, had catheter care mm -hmm. for whatever surgery and or other you know, long-term health issues, uh, you know, maybe their just body isn't used to like voiding on their own. You know, mm -hmm. the urination process either slows down or stops entirely. Like, mm -hmm. how do you help a patient like that? Like, that could be you know obviously male or female. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how can something like that help over time if, if they've been catheterized for a period of time due to hospitalization or whatever? Right. I mean, I think it's also, you have to think about like the potential trauma that was caused by the catheter as well. Um, and so from a pelvic floor standpoint, like, again, like determining whether, like what is actually happening in the pelvic floor itself around like that. So the urethra, like it runs basically right through the pelvic floor. So usually there's something going on the actual muscles themselves around there. So basically working on that also, um, having like voiding schedules, um, and like a bladder diary at home. So all of those kind of in like conjunction together, like, you know, as I said, assessing what's actually happening in the pelvic floor, managing that, and then also working on some of the behavioral side of things, which is like that bladder diary and voiding schedule and all that kind of stuff to kind of work together to figure that out. So what would a typical patient expect through your care in terms of like time frame? Like, how do you know when, when either A, they're getting better or, you know, what's the typical pelvic floor? Like we know in, the, in sports rehab, and I know you're specialist in sports, physical therapy and orthopedic care as well. 
what would be like your time frame to say, hey, this this therapy is going to work for mm-hmm. you, or it's not, or you have to make some adjustments. If it's yeah. once a week for a period of you know, how long would yep. someone typically see results? Uh, so typically about four to six visits, plus or minus two. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> so it's, not it's a, usually a, the range. A, a super long term situation. No, you, and you can get a sense correct. pretty quick. Okay. Yes, and also like there's a lot of things that can be done at home, supplementary. So like. You know, a lot of this also depends on one, how long has this been going on for, right? Is it super chronic? Then that's gonna be more of that six plus two, right? Um, Is this something that we're treating kind of right away? That's gonna be a little quicker. Are you um, doing the exercise I'm giving you at home and the strategies? Then like, again, that's gonna be a little quicker. Um, So I think it really just, there's a lot of, like there's a lot of factors in play, but like if I'm not seeing some kind of change after like four visits, like then I'm starting to be a little, like maybe we need to go talk to the doctor again um, and see if there's something else we're missing here. Um, but yeah, usually about four to six visits. And besides your, your exam and your Mm -hmm. expertise, are there certain, you know, objective uh, diagnostics that you would, you know, maybe ask a patient to get, you know, maybe an MRI, maybe an x-ray, maybe a, a nerve conduction study, something like that to help you further assess that patient depending on, you know, to really pinpoint what's going on with them. Or sometimes, you know, I, I know like as a musculoskeletal therapist, mm-hmm. you know, we tend to look like the, the large muscle groups, you know, psoas muscles, yeah. flexor muscles, but like, I don't think a lot of doctors that have, don't have the pelvic floor know-how and the right. knowledge start getting into the intrinsic muscles and the, the interior pelvic muscles. Yeah. So, um, you know, well, how would you, you know, look at all, all of that combined, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I think it's, things. there's some things that like are more kind of like urogenital type stuff or um, NGI testing, right? Like motility testing, um, like post void residuals, um, like all that kind of stuff. Like basically see if like people are actually emptying their bladder or how like fast like things are transferring through their actual like, you know, digestive tract and all that kind of stuff. So um, more testing along like, like that route. Um, also like your analysis, one of the biggest things I tend to see is um, like a very common story. Patients come in and they're like, I had you know 10 UTIs in the past year. I went to urgent care every time. Like they did the urinalysis. It didn't come back conclusive or it didn't come back. They just gave me antibiotics. Um, and like most of the time the patient didn't actually have a UTI. They just basically had pelvic pain, which actually like mimics the symptoms of a UTI. And so they basically just got like 10 rounds of antibiotics. I'm exaggerating, but like, you know, that's yeah. like the point is that like they're just got that many rounds of antibiotics for something they didn't actually need. So like, I'm also curious about your analysis if like it actually came back as positive for having infection in there. Um, so all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think that's a key point because I think uh, like our viewers should understand like, you know, obviously proper diagnosis is key to any proper treatment. So the better we can assess and find out what exactly is going on versus just, like you said, throwing out mm-hmm. medications and throwing out drugs and like, you know, unfortunately in our, our world and I think that's where, you know, therapists, uh, uh, you know, physical therapists uh, in particular, OTs, you know, uh, all different types of therapists do an excellent job because you're really looking for, you know, manual causes, you're looking for, you know, physiological causes, you, you know, and you're combining it with, like you said, psychosomatic mm-hmm. and other things and just trying to say, hey, let's, let's see what we can do without the drugs, without the surgery initially mm-hmm. and see how we can help this patient. Uh, you know, and then from there you can assess, hey, this is a, the proper protocol, or this is the proper course of care, or we need to take this a, ne- a step further. I think sometimes, um, you know, working with those professionals. So, so from working with other types of doctors, you know, I, I would suspect, you know, OBGYNs, uh, you know, maybe some pain management mm-hmm. doctors, physiatrists, mm-hmm. uh, those are probably uh, doctors that would be, you know, good uh, referral sources, mm-hmm. you know, for you, and, and, yeah. and hopefully, you know, you're working with them as well, so yep. patients know, um, what types of doctors that they should be working with mm-hmm. in, in, in conjunction to help uh, get this success. And, and they should ask for a pelvic floor therapist. I've, I've told my yes. family uh, <laughs> members, you know, go see a pelvic floor mm-hmm. therapist because maybe it's something that they could help you with. Yeah. And a lot of people just aren't aware of always what it is, how it works, mm-hmm. um, what to expect. Um, you know, uh, surely there's a privacy component to to this type of you know yes. practice. So uh, most of what you do is done in a private room. Mm-hmm. And if there's an internal component, you review it with the patient, you explain to them what it is. Yes, right? that's also so, very, yeah. I also want to put out there that that's optional, yeah. right? Yeah. Like it's like, it's beneficial, but it's also like patients also have like full control over that situation. Yeah. I'll never force it on anyone. And like, they have to like, they have to uh, verbally consent. They also have to physically consent. And like, it's right. very obvious when someone's not physically consenting and I will not do an internal on someone that like it is not okay with. 
Um, I think that like other kind of like a point to what you're just talking about um, is that, um, you know, I think that in our society, a bunch of things are kind of normalized, right? Like I've had so many women come in and be like, I like, I have leakage, it's just a normal amount. And I'm like, but zero is the normal amount, right? Like some leakage <laughs> right, is right. not normal. Right, right. Um, and I think that, you know, like, it, like there's just certain things that have been normalized and like, as a result, people won't necessarily seek out pelvic PT right away. And like, I think my message on that is just like, if you think that something is like not normal or like something's going on that like is not normal for you, like the sooner, the better that you like go out and like seek someone and like, and we are, we are there to help. Like, it's like, you know, this exists for a reason because this is, it's a very common problem. It's a very common issue and a very common like need. And I think that, uh, people are just a little bit like more shy and nervous about kind of seeking it out because there's some kind of, you know, like kind of like, uh, negative kind of feeling towards it for some people. Um, but like, I'm here to say it's like, there's a lot more that's going on than I think people realize. Yeah. And I think also people should understand if properly diagnosed mm -hmm. and if it's the proper, um, application of your therapy, I'm going to guess you have a pretty high success rate. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, and I think that's what people should understand is mm -hmm. if, if they actually seek the care and it's properly assessed and properly diagnosed, you help a large amount of patients with their condition and I think they're very grateful and, and thankful for yes. it uh, where others you know may have like just kind of like poo-pooed it or moved yes. it along or just didn't want to deal with the or the real issue right you know? and that's that's what I do see a lot of is a lot of patients coming in they're very thankful when they do come in because they're like well they got the runaround for a really long time and actually going back to like a previous like point that we talked about with like males right I see it's a lot more of male patients too because like I think it's just not normalized enough with males and so as a result like it's like people just like for years are just like, we don't know what to do with you. And then eventually someone is like, sends them to a pelvic PT and that's when they start to get better. Yeah, and I think that's a, a key component. You know, men typically don't take care of themselves quite as well. <laughs> and I can imagine when it comes to the pelvic health, it's probably even less. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, they have chest pain, like, oh, yeah. maybe I should go see the doctor. They have this, maybe I should be able, if they have other issues, they're like, nah, yeah. I'll, 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 I'll live with it. But they, you don't necessarily have to live with it. This mm -hmm. is something that you can, you know, get help for uh, a lot of different conditions. Like you said, you know, pelvic pain, mm -hmm. You know, incontinence, you know, uh, leakage, mm -hmm. urinary leakage. Um, there's a lot of different things. So, uh, and understand like back component, if you've had, you know, prostate, mm -hmm. uh, even if you had prostate surgery, yep. uh, if you're dealing with, you know, certain types of treatment, uh, this could all be beneficial. So, I think, uh, you know, men, uh, females, uh, you, you tend to see people like a little bit, you know, middle aged versus or, or adolescents sometimes, uh, uh, teenagers or. So, it varies. Um, I tend to not see as many of like the, like, I don't really see the pediatric population. Um, kind of like the rule of thumb is that like, if someone has not had a gynecological exam, like that they are not necessarily like gonna, they're not appropriate for internal exam. Right. Um, I will treat them externally. Um, but, uh, it, it varies, right? I have a lot of, um, younger adults, uh, who have some issues. There's some kind of like cultural issues related to, um, basically pain with intercourse. Um, I have a lot of patients, as I said, pregnancy postpartum is kind of like my, my specialization and my specialization. I do a lot of stuff related to that. So, you know, a lot of the 20, 30, 40 year olds, um, who are pregnant postpartum and then a lot of like, um, post menopause. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of hormonal shifts in menopause, um, that kind of cause a lot of pain, like a lot of pain and dysfunction in the pelvic floor. Yeah. So a lot of those patients. And well, just, just curious, would fertility or infertility potentially have something to do with the pelvic floor? Like, is that something that mm -hmm. you could potentially help with if, if women are trying to get pregnant and they're having trouble and maybe, you know, whatever physiologically is, is causing some, some issues mm -hmm. for them? Absolutely. Um, I think it's always worth in that situation to get the pelvic floor checked out. Um, because again, it's so directly, um, like related to all structures that are involved in, um, you know, fertility and, uh, and pregnancy. So absolutely. Yes. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I want to thank you very much for this uh, show. Uh, very informative. Uh, I think pelvic floor is a uh, health and pelvic floor therapy is sort of like a, an unknown. Uh, and I yeah. think, uh, educating our, our, our patients and our, our viewers here is a, is a great thing. So I want to thank you, Rachel, for uh, joining us today. And, uh, Appreciate having you. Thank so, you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, again, thank you for joining us at Health IQ. I'm Dr. Siegel, and we will see you at our next show. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.